ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. And this momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. People all know Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, but do we really believe that dream can become a reality? That speech was 54 years ago, and when we look around now, it may not seem like we are any closer to that dream today than we were back then. Well, today we have a story that just might change your mind about the level of reconciliation that is possible in this issue of race. I'm Jeff Eckert. I'm Jason Brewer. And this is The Thought Factory. The Thought Factory podcast is brought to you by Never the Same, cultivating students through biblical discipleship and spiritual disciplines using theology, community, and technology. Learn more at neverthesame.org. Welcome to the Thought Factory podcast. We want to thank all of you who have joined us for this episode today, as well as those who have joined us in the last two seasons. Today, we have an incredible story to share. We do. In our first part, today's part two, but just this idea and the concept of students and race today. So last episode, we talked to our good friend Steve Anderson. He talked about students in high school and anthem protests, and we talked about hope for today and the reconciliation that may already be happening. So we want to Encourage you to go back. If you haven't listened to that episode, it's really a powerful one. And next episode, we are talking about students and their youth group as well as church and asking the question, are students leaving the church? We're going to be looking into some research that we did this summer from students all over the country and their responses to questions about their loyalty to their youth groups, their loyalty to their local church, what that means for us today. And it's, like you said, Jason, that question, are students leaving the church? It's a powerful question. It's a question a lot of people are asking, and we think we've got some good answers to explore next episode. As always, you can connect with us on iTunes. You can find us on YouTube. You can find us on Instagram. Where, Jeff? Well, my Instagram, I want to post a picture of our story today of Will and Matt, our friends, but mine is at Jeff Eckert, J-E-F-F-E-C-K-A-R-T. Now, we've you mentioned YouTube. We are just diving into that. Uh, a lot of people like me, I'm, I guess I'm a weirdo, but I do listen to some podcasts and some audio only on YouTube. So if you're like me and you're weird, you can look us up. However, what we found is we are really right now kind of hard to find on YouTube. We're working on that, but we're also going to be posting links here and there, different places, our Facebook pages and Instagrams and things. So if you do like listening on YouTube, you can find us there as well. That's we also, new for us. Yes, very new. We also have companion blogs that follow each episode. So if you want to quickly read through some of the the highlights of the podcast, you can find that on neverthesame.org backslash blog. And for today, we have a story that is about two guys, Will Ford and Matt Lockett. We'll start with Will and get to Matt later. But you're going to hear a story that you will never forget. It is something that brings Martin Luther King's speech to life. And it all starts with a kettle pot in Louisiana. So here's Will talking about his family. So it turns out they were owned by a slave master there in Lake Providence, Louisiana, an overseer there in that, on that plantation who would beat the slaves for, for just about any reason. And praying was one of them. And the irony back then is that they wanted slaves to be Christians because they knew that Christian slaves made better workers. But they would twist the gospel back then and pervert it and say that slaves be obedient to your masters if you want to go to heaven. But it's easy to teach slaves that back then because it was against the law for slaves to read and write. And it was against the law for anybody to teach them how to read and write. The irony is that while they wanted them to be Christians, they didn't want them to pray because they felt like prayer would foster hope. And if they got hopeful, they'd run away. 
This man would literally beat him on that plantation if he heard him praying. We had a story passed down in our family of this great uncle of ours who was literally beaten to death simply for going fishing without asking. And uh, his back was just shredded after being being whipped to death. So that's how cruel they were on this plantation. But in spite of the threat and because of their love for Jesus, they were Christians, they would sneak away and they would pray anyway. So what they would do is they'd go out into the barn with that old cast iron pot that my grandfather, my, 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 my grandmother told me about, my father washed clothes in. They'd go out into that barn late at night and take that pot with them. They, they, and they were going to a barn late at night to make sure that their prayer meeting wasn't seen, wasn't seen or heard on the plantation. They'd take the pot in there with them, and then they would turn that pot upside down on the cabin floor of that barn, or that barn, so it'd be turned upside down. They would take some rocks and prop it up so it'd be suspended off the ground about an inch or two. Now picture this. They would lay flat on the ground or prostrate themselves around that kettle and put their lips in between the opening between that ground that's being suspended by the rocks so that the kettle muffled their voices as they prayed through the night. And the story that was passed down with this pot is this, is that they didn't think they would see freedom in their time, so they prayed for the freedom of their children and the next generation. Just to be clear, the slave owners manipulated the gospel to eliminate prayer, therefore attempting to eliminate any hope. As Will is becoming immersed in his family's history, he has a significant dream. He gave me a dream. This dream I had about Martin Luther King. It was right before I was getting ready to go to Dexter Avenue Baptist Church where my friend um, Lou Engel was going to do a uh, reconciliation service there. Dexter Avenue Baptist Church is the first church that Dr. King preached at where the civil rights movement broke out. But before um, I go there, I had a dream about the dream with Dr. King. In the dream, uh, we're on our way to Dexter Avenue. So we have to go by this house to pick up Dr. King. And in the dream, of course, it's a dream. He's alive. <laughs> and he comes out of this house in this dream. And there's this huge white duffel bag with black handles on it. And in the dream, he starts emptying all this dark garbage out of the duffel bag. And he throws the bag down violently to come and get into this vehicle with us. In the dream, I, I turn back to go pick up the bag as a souvenir. But before I could touch it, Dr. King grabs me on my shoulders and he says, no, do not go back and pick that up. And in the dream, he starts telling me what I need to do to heal the race issue in America. And uh, I wake up from the dream. I didn't even realize that I'd been weeping in intercession all night. My pillow was soaked with tears. I shared the dream with my friend, Lou Engel. He began to weep. We didn't even know what the interpretation was. We began to pray and ask God for the interpretation. All of a sudden, the Lord reminded me of that black white bag with the black handles. And I realized that white bag represented my white baggage. And the black handles represented how my generation of blacks had, have handled that white baggage. God was saying to me, William, get rid of your white baggage. You've been carrying it for way too long. He was saying to me, get rid of your bitterness. Get rid of your resentment. Get rid of your guilt manipulation. Get rid of any uh, unforgiveness. Get rid of your white baggage so we can all get in a new vehicle that can bring revival of justice to everybody. Because only a united church can heal a divided nation. And, uh, you know, I've shared this dream, and one of the things I always share when I sh- sh- share it is one thing to everybody. What color is your baggage? <laughs> whatever it is, whatever it looks like, get rid of it because we need each other, because only a united church can heal a divided nation right now. So after I shared that at the service, it's a powerful time, as you can probably imagine. And Lou said, you know what, I want you to share this dream and share your story with the kettle in Washington, D.C. It's January 17th. 2005, it'll be Martin Luther King Celebration Day. We have a gathering that day at the Lincoln Memorial where Dr. King did the speech, and then I want you to speak that night. So, but little did I know, the rest of my unfinished business was about to come to fruition. Hello? Hello, Matt. Yes? Jason Brewer. So after the formality of the hellos and the how are you's, we jump into Matt's story. I mentioned that it was a painful thing for uh, my family about family stories and and history because our family didn't know where we came from. You know, my dad was one of 16 siblings. And uh, what's strange about it is that somewhere along the way, the story broke down and fell apart. Somewhere along the way, 
somebody stop telling the stories. And so my dad and his generation, they didn't know where they came from. It was, you know, he, he would actually make a joke about it and say, well, I guess we're just a bunch of mutts from Kentucky. You know, he would laugh about it, but I knew that that it, it hurt his heart. You know, he, he, you know, just like anybody else, you want to know where you come from. So Matt is trying to discover his past, but he just can't seem to get anywhere. My dad passed away on January 17th, 2004, and uh, uh, it really threw me for a tailspin, uh, to be honest. I've been well established in the Lord for most of my life, and yet when I lost dad, uh, you start asking the hard questions in life. They're good questions. I'm asking things like, who am I? Why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing with my life? What's the story that I'm supposed to be telling? You know, there's something about discovering your roots. And so I, I did something unusual. I decided that I was going to do what no one else in our family had ever done. I was going to get the breakthrough on where our family came from. And I spent all of 2004 looking for answers. And uh, what was really frustrating was I finished that year more frustrated than I had begun the process because I hit all the same roadblocks that everyone else in our family had ever hit. You know, I had cousins, aunts, and uncles that had tried this before, and I hit all the same roadblocks that they hit. And so I was finishing 2004 in a, a, a place of emotional frustration and, and kind of just, you know, I look back now and I call it the divine discontent. Something was wrong and I didn't know what it was, but I, I look back now and I know it was God. And so it was during that time that I had a dream and it was a, it was a strange dream and I, I don't have time to get into it now, but you know, I read my Bible and I see that it's very clear. There are times when God will give messages and he will lead believers uh, with dreams. We see that um, uh, throughout the Bible. We see it in the new Testament with the apostles. And uh, you know, this was one of those times in the dream, there was a man named Lou Engel. And what's fascinating about that is I didn't know who Lou Engel was. And I, I thought the whole thing was kind of weird, to be honest, but I couldn't get away from it. And so I, I got a, my hands on a recording of Lou Engel preaching. He made this one statement that stuck out to me. He said this, what moves you? What is your passion? Stay close to the burning bush in your life. What burns in you and never goes out, when you find something like that, draw close to it and you'll hear your name called. Of course, he's referring to Moses and his encounter with God at the burning bush. You know, he saw a bush on fire and it wasn't going out. When God saw that he turned aside to see that there was a moment, it wasn't enough for him just to see it and keep moving on. It says that when he turned to see this thing, then God calls to him and he says, Moses, end of that year where I'd had this painful experience about losing my dad, trying to find my roots. And I'm and I'm hearing this statement and and I just had one prayer that I began to pray after this. God, I want to hear my name called. Will calls his friend Lou Engel, who invites Will to share at this event on January 17th, 2005, while Matt has a dream of someone he doesn't know named Lou Engel. Matt reaches out to find this man named Lou. And after talking, Lou invites Matt to attend the same event where Will is sharing his family's history. I traveled across the country. I took my 10 year old daughter with me. Uh, and we went to Washington, D.C. And I found myself standing on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And it's such a historic spot. Of course, that's the place where we celebrate the life of the great emancipator, Abraham Lincoln. It's the spot where Martin Luther King Jr. gave the I Have a Dream speech. What's fascinating is that it was in that place, in that very spot, that's where I met my friend, Will Ford. And uh, that night, we gathered at a local church, and this man, Will Ford, uh, pulled out onto the stage this large black iron kettle, and he began to tell the story about how his slave ancestors had used that kettle pot to pray for the ending of slavery. And and I'm listening to that story, and I, I'm, I'm just a, a, a mess of emotions because I'd just gone through this year of uh, searching and was frustrated. And of course, it was the one year anniversary exactly to my father passing away. And, and then Will was telling the story and he, and he said this, it stunned me. He said that the kettle had been handed down to Harriet Lockett, 
who handed it down to Nora Lockett and then down to his uh, grandfather and father and down to him. And, and I was stunned because think about this for the, the months leading up to this gathering, I had one prayer that I was praying, God, I want to hear my name called. Now I'm sitting there looking at this kettle and I'm literally hearing my name called. So, you know, after the service, I went up and I met Will and he'd never met a locket before. And, uh, and he asked me this, he said, how did you spell it with one T or two? And I said, two. And he said, well, our locket spelled it with one. And he said, well, where are your lockets from? And I said, well, actually, we don't really know. We think from Kentucky. And he said, well, our lockets were down in Louisiana. And we thought it was this amazing coincidence. But it was enough that we prayed together that night. We prayed for some very uh, heartfelt prayers for racial reconciliation because we felt like that's what God was highlighting. Uh, prayed for revival in America. Prayed for each other. But more than that, it, 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 we, we became connected as friends and then as brothers and really uh, just as lifelong covenant brothers. So what they didn't realize was that on January 17th, 2005, this meeting would change their understanding of their lives and of the dream of racial reconciliation. Hey, Dan Seaborn here from Winning at Home. I've had the privilege of being friends with Jeff and Jason. Uh, Jeff, known as a youth pastor comrade for many years, Jason effectively uh, made a difference in my daughter's life. Let me just say something. This thing they've developed, the NTS camps, never the same. I believe that statement's so true. These guys are pouring their heart and soul into make a difference in the lives of teens and effectively in the lives of parents as well. And I want to encourage you I endorse them fully. Get your kids to these camps because if they go there, they won't be the same. They will come home with a different attitude, different spirit. Everything you're looking for, that's what they're going to come home with. And so I challenge you as a parent. I challenge you even as a teen. Consider it because I believe this will make a mark for the kingdom and a mark in your life. Check it out. I highly encourage you to pursue this because I believe it will be effective in furthering the walk of your family with the Lord Jesus Christ. A few years go by. Matt has relocated his family to Washington, D.C. Lou helps Matt launch a national prayer ministry called Bound for Life. He is still searching for a breakthrough in discovering his family history. He and Lou decide to go and pray at Appomattox Courthouse, the location where General Lee surrenders to General Grant, ending the Civil War in America. We went into the little visitor center that was there, and Lou and I found ourselves standing at a bookcase side by side. And he grabs the first book off the shelf that caught his eye, and he opens it to a random page. And I kid you not, it was a page called The Battle of Lockett's Farm. And he asked me, what's this? And I had no idea. And it was really kind of a shocking moment because, again, I feel like I'm in a, a holy moment, like a Moses moment where I'm hearing my name called. So I buy the book, and I begin to research it. And what I found out was that the last battle of the American Civil War was fought in the front yard of a family named Lockett. And so, in fact, when Lee had turned his cannons around, he was in the front yard of that family, and the Union Army was in the backyard. And the Union Army won the battle in that place, and surrender is what followed. And so uh, I, I'm stunned by this because I've been praying this Appomattox courthouse dream for nearly a decade at that point. And I'm thinking, this has got to mean something. This can't be a coincidence. And it was right about that time that my brother— did something that none of us had ever been able to do. He got the breakthrough on our genealogy. And so he'd been using some online tools and some different connections have been made where all of a sudden the whole thing opens up. And he comes to, and visits me and he says, you know, I got us all the way back to 1645. And I can't believe what I'm hearing. But he says, we came in as settlers through Virginia. And I, I said, oh, you're not going to believe this. Have I got a Virginia story for you? And I began to share with him about the Civil War. And he stops me. He says, wait a minute, that's not that place down by Sailor's Creek, is it? I said, that's exactly where it is. He said, I just found that documentation that was our family. So think about this. After a decade of praying the Appomattox dream and contending against this injustice in America and praying that we wouldn't be driven to another Appomattox, I find out not only was it fought in the, the, the front yard of a family named Loggett, it was my family. And, and, and I'm stunned by this revelation, but I, I had to do the very the, the next thing. You know, uh, I have a team that I pray with here. We, 
we got in a van and we drove down to that place to visit it. You know, we, we found uh, the, the house is still there. It's still riddled with bullet holes. It's been preserved uh, as a piece of history. But in the front yard, there's a, a stone marker. And on it, it says, here, Lee fought his last battle. So there's no exaggeration here. This is the place. So I met the man who, who lives there now, and he invited us into his living room. And I'm shocked because I walk in and framed and hanging on the wall is the locket genealogy. And I look at it, and it's exactly the research that we had just found. It's my family. So there's no question about this. And he asked me, what do you know about your family? And I said, well, we don't know much. And he said, well, some of you left here and went to Kentucky. Which Matt already knew, and some went to the Deep South, specifically Alabama. There was one <laughs> member of our family, a man named Napoleon Lockett, his wife, Mary, and he moved to Marion County, Alabama. And they were pretty well-to-do uh, socialite status kind of people. They, I think we found that they had 126 slaves right. mm -hmm. down there, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know they were very influential people. And when the Civil War broke out, Mary decided that she didn't think it was right that the Confederacy didn't have a flag of its own. And so she commissions the design of the original Confederate flag called the Stars and Bars. She gets together in one historical account. It says she gathered with her friends in their home and they sewed it together. And then she took it to Montgomery and she presented it to the Confederate president, Jefferson Davis. And they ran that flag up on the flagpole at the, the White House of the Confederacy. And in fact, there's a there's an oil painting uh, of Mary Lockett in the White House still today commemorating her contribution. But uh, Will, go ahead and share with them uh, your perspective on that. Yeah, so so think about it. So through this one flag that was put up there by, by, by Mary Lockett, the deal is this, Mary Lockett and her friends sold that together in their house there in Marion County, Alabama. And hand delivered it to Jefferson Davis. Uh, Mary Lockett became basically the, the Betsy Ross for the Confederacy. So the Lockett family were also they were also responsible for the Confederate flag, the flag of rebellion, being raised up over the nation. But isn't it interesting? Isn't it powerful that through the same family, where the flag of rebellion was raised up in the nation? Listen, the flag of surrender went up in their front yard there in Virginia. Going back to the Lockett Farm in Virginia, the man who told them about their family moving to Kentucky and to Alabama also told them about a third place the Lockett's moved to. But then he said this. Some left and went to Louisiana. And in some cases, there was clerical errors where in these old handwritten ledgers, and he said in some cases, the, the spelling of the name was changed and it only had one T. And I'm, I'm hearing this and I can't believe what I'm hearing. And I'm I'm thinking this can't possibly be true. In the house, Matt's family's house, the place where the Civil War ended, Matt finds out that his family were the creators of the Confederate flag and also the slave owners of Will's family. I gather up all this research and I fly down to Dallas and I spend a day with my friend Will Ford and we look at all of this together and we just weep over it because we can't believe what God was revealing. Matt's family is the family that owned my family where that kettle pot came from in Lake Providence, Louisiana. Maybe there's a redemptive reason and purpose for every family that we're born into. Maybe there's a bigger storyline going on than what we realize. They're down in Lake Providence praying for the ending of slavery and all the way up in Virginia at the farmhouse of the people who used to own them. Slavery comes to an end in their front yard. Of the people who used to own them there in Virginia. There was another discovery about the Lockett family. Some of them were abolitionist preachers. I was stunned when I discovered that, that it was painful to know about the slave owners in my family, but I've got something else of a redemptive root that I've laid a hold of, and that's the root that I'm tapping into. Those are the prayer bowls that I'm resourcing. I'll give you a good example of choosing a different storyline, a redemptive storyline. It was illegal for slaves to learn how to read and write before the end of the Civil War, but guess what? It was still pretty unpopular after the Civil War. And so there were slaves that would still, in secret, try to learn to read and write, uh, but they would do it secretly because they still believed that there would be consequences. And so that was happening there uh, at the Lockett Farm. And uh, one night, Lucy Lockett 
walked in and caught a former slave trying to teach her son how to read and write. Instead of there being consequences, in that moment, Lucy does something unexpected. She said, no, what you're doing is wise. And then what she does is she takes over tutoring the young boy how to read and write. This story is recorded in his autobiography. He actually became a, a man of, of importance and note. And so the very man, Robert Moden, who uh, gets taught how to read through the Lockett family, winds up being education advisor to four presidents, president of Tuskegee University after uh, Booker T. Washington uh, turns it over to him. And then when the Lincoln Memorial is, is, is built, he's the one that does the dedication speech. He does a dedication speech for the Lincoln Memorial where Dr. King does a speech and where Matt and I meet later on. I love this man. I love his family. He loves my family. You know, we've been running together for over 12 years. Now. I have a dream that one day on the Red Hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream. There's always a couple of powerful moments when Will and I share this story. And, you know, we've we've been all around the country. We've shared this in churches and conferences. We've shared it in uh, secular civic settings. And mm -hmm. it's always the same. Uh, you know, when Will talks about his dream about getting rid of your baggage, there's almost like a like a collective sigh from everyone, whether you're white or black or whatever color you are. There's a collective sigh uh, uh, at that at that uh, statement. But then I do something else when 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 I talk about it, I acknowledge the pain of uh, my African American brothers and sisters, and I said, you know, if you've never mm -hmm. been in a in a in a, a setting where someone has acknowledged what you're saying and acknowledged the pain that you feel, uh, I want to be the first to do it. You know, and and I I apologize in the, in these settings. And there's another collective sigh that happens. You know, I think that that to, uh, it's it's so critical that the church would have. Uh, a higher perspective because everybody's got a perspective. You know, we mm -hmm. talk about this. There's a white perspective about what life looks like in America. There's a different black perspective about what life looks like in America. And those two things couldn't be more different right now. And the two yeah. aren't hearing each other. And I think it's, mm -hmm. I think the onus is on the church to, to mm -hmm. own it, to own the day, to own the message of reconciliation and to preach it with authority, but not just preach it, but live it. Yeah. Exactly. You'd asked, you know, what what youth workers, uh, how they can find application and, and do something about this. You know, I mentioned earlier that that uh, when Lee turned around his cannons in the front yard, the Union Army was in the backyard. And one historical account I read said this. It said, as you can see, the only thing that stood between the two armies was the Lockett House. And that's <laughs> been such a powerful picture for me because I see yes. that everything we're talking about this, it is a picture of intercession. It's a picture mm -hmm. of being willing to get in between the two brothers that are trying to rip each other to shreds. And, and, and it, the book said this, it said that at the end of the day, when the battle was over, that that house became a hospital for both sides and the floorboards were stained with the blood of both North and South. It is a picture of intercession. And, and I feel like for youth workers in particular, you have such an opportunity to, mm -hmm. to em, embrace this message of intercession and to own this day right now, because uh, I believe that you're working with a generation that is pre-programmed for justice. I believe yeah. that the empathy of God is literally stamped on their spiritual DNA. And so uh, the, the, there's such an opportunity for youth workers right mm -hmm. now to, to mobilize young people with a perspective to, to be in that house. And, and, and you see it. it. They're so natural to do it. The problem, though, is that as a youth worker, more than likely your youth group represents one particular neighborhood or one particular mm -hmm. school. And so, you know, you don't, you know, many youth workers won't find a lot of diversity in their uh, in their youth groups and in their 
their youth ministries. So here's what I, I just want to make a suggestion. I think this is what has to happen is you have to have exposure to someone else's point of view. I think what we have to do is get in that house of prayer. And this is why Mm -hmm. it's so important right now. What if youth leaders and youth workers started setting up prayer meetings that intentionally put a racial mix together? See, everybody's got a bias and a point of view, but I've learned this over the years is you really learn a lot about somebody else when you pray with them. I think exactly right. I think prayer meetings are a gift from God because you, you get your focus off yourself and, and ideally you're getting your focus on the heart of God. And what if youth workers started intentionally reaching across the city, to, uh, reaching across to other schools that they don't have kids in and, and start holding prayer meetings like corporate prayer meetings where we intentionally Create the racial mix that I believe reflects the family of God. Matt and Will's story doesn't end with the injustice of their family's past, but their message today is that the injustice against the unborn can indeed end legally. Wherever and whenever they tell their story, they share their passion for speaking for those who have no voice to speak on their own behalf. And so that's what I'm daring to believe that the same God who broke the power of Dred Scott, listen, he can break the power of Roe v. Wade. He can put it into, you know, human trafficking, sex slavery. He can shut down systemic poverty. He can put it into mass incarceration. He can uh, bring a shift in, in major areas that we've always given up on. Listen, he's just looking for a group of people who will drop their agendas, come together and believe. In fact, Matt's ministry bound for life centers around using prayer as the primary strategy for the ending of abortion in America. We encourage you to visit their website, Bound for Life, the number four, boundforlife.com, to learn more and to get involved. You can also learn more about their message at thegodofprovidence.com. Students are living in a time where they are aware that racial reconciliation is an important issue of our day. Even though this episode was not directly about students or for youth leaders, This story is worth sharing because its message applies to all generations. We hope that as a result of listening to this episode that you are more hopeful about what God can do to bring people together in unity, regardless of who they are and where they come from. The Thought Factory podcast is brought to you by Never the Same, whose vision is to see new generations transformed in Christ to further the kingdom of God. Learn more at neverthesame.org.